As you've noticed, there's lots of different brands of cameras out there. There's Nikon, Canon, Sony, Pentax, Olympus. How do you choose which one's right for you? Ultimately, any camera made in the last five years or so is gonna produce beautiful images. Brand doesn't matter. Now, if you already have a bunch of lenses from a particular brand, there's not really any reason to switch, so just stick with what you've got. It's not the camera, you probably just need to learn a little bit more. Now I'm an icon shooter, but when I first started, I'd look at my friends who shot Canon and their images looked really good compared to mine. And I'd say, well, maybe I should change brands. I'd see people shooting with phase one and I'd say, wow, maybe I need a more expensive medium format camera. Then my images will look really good. That's not the case. All I needed to do was learn how to use my camera to get good images. Now I just said brand doesn't matter when you're choosing a camera and that's totally true. But there's other things to consider besides just the brand. There's also the size, the weight, and the price. For example, this little mirrorless camera is a lot smaller and lighter than all of these other DSLRs. So it really depends on what your purpose and use for your camera is gonna be. Are you gonna go backpacking with it? Are you gonna bring it with you every single day? Maybe you want a smaller, lighter camera. Are you shooting in a studio where size and weight really don't matter? Then maybe you want a bigger camera. Ultimately, figure out what you need the camera for before you make a decision. Before digital, film size dictated three factors. Its size, its cost, and its weight. So those that picked, say, a 35mm film camera did that primarily because it was cheaper and it was smaller. But those that were working in the field professionally were still shooting with medium format and large format cameras. And the ones that chose large format cameras, for example, did that primarily because they wanted to have larger prints with a lot more details than, say, a 35mm film camera could produce. So the same concepts apply to digital cameras. Now, with digital cameras, there is obviously no film. Instead, there is an imaging sensor. But the same size, weight, and cost considerations apply, just like with film. So if you go with a smaller compact camera versus a full frame or a medium format digital camera, you're going for a smaller size, lower cost, and lower weight. Now let's talk about different sensor sizes. Today, if you're looking around, you'll find everything from a one inch sensor to micro four thirds to CX, DX, FX, and all kinds of hard to understand verbiage. What does it all mean? Essentially, there are different names for systems and different sizes of sensors. So for example, if you hear reference to one inch sensor, it literally means one inch diagonal sensor. If you hear something like CX, DX, or FX in Nikon's language, that literally translates to different systems with different sizes of sensors. Basically, the larger the sensor, the better the image quality will be. But at the same time, it means it will cost more, it will be bigger, and it will weigh more. Now, I have different cameras from different manufacturers on this table. There's a Fuji, a Canon, and a few Nikon cameras. Does it mean that I should be able to interchange lenses between all these different cameras? For example, should I be able to take this Fuji lens and mount it on a Nikon camera? Is it even possible? Unfortunately, it's not. And that's because Nikon developed their own system with their own lenses. So the Nikon lens communicates with the Nikon body, and that's the way it's designed to be. Whereas Canon lenses communicate with the Canon bodies. And that's why all these different systems have their own proprietary mounts. Now, you could have third-party uh, lens manufacturers like Zeiss or Sigma make lenses for Nikon, and you'll see references in, in uh, manufacturer information. So, for example, if you buy a Sigma lens, it will say Sigma for Nikon F mount. The same with Canon. If you buy a third-party lens, it will say that it's designed for the Canon mount. Earlier in the video, you heard us talk about mirrorless and DSLR cameras. And in this short segment, I want to explain what the DSLR stands for and what a mirrorless stands for and what the difference between the two are. So right here, I have a Nikon D800E DSLR and a Fuji X-T1 mirrorless camera. Why is this camera called DSLR and why is this called mirrorless? SLR literally stands for single lens reflex. And what that means is when I'm looking through the viewfinder, I should be able to see no matter what lens I attach, what the lens is gathering. All the light that's, that's coming through the lens, and that concept is called TTL, which stands for through the lens. So all that light that comes through the lens gets projected into the mirror that's sitting right here at a 45 degree angle, then that goes up into a pentaprism, which then reflects it back through the viewfinder. 
So that concept has been there for years, for many years. And if I take this lens off, you can see that there is a mirror right there. So if I take a picture, and that's happening because the mirror is flapping up, the light, at that time, the light comes through and the image sensor captures the image. And for the rest of the time, when it's down in, in its downward position, that's for me to be able to see it in the back. Now with mirrorless cameras, and the reason why they're called mirrorless, obviously there is no mirror. So the light comes through the lens into the sensor, and as the sensor is capturing the information and capturing the image, that same information gets duplicated over in this digital viewfinder. So here I have an optical viewfinder, and here I have a digital viewfinder. With the optical viewfinder, I'm always going to see the image. Whereas with this camera, if I don't turn it on, there is nothing being projected into the viewfinder. So that's the, diff that's the main difference between the two. Also, you can see if, you, if I put the camera side by side, that this camera is actually much thicker than this camera. And that's one of the main reasons why these mirrorless cameras are the future and why they're so much lighter and easier to manufacture. There is no need for that mirror. There is no need for the pentaprism on the top of the camera. All it is, is the, this flange distance, which is the distance between the mount and the sensor, is reduced just because of the mirror not being there. Hence, these cameras are much easier to make, like I said, and they're cheaper to make too. All right, so we just talked about cameras. Now let's talk about lenses. What is a lens? A lens is basically a piece of glass that's designed to gather light and focus it. So right here I have different lenses. I have big lenses and I have small lenses. What is the difference between them? Some of these lenses are designed for specialty needs. Like these three lenses are for wildlife and sports photographers. Whereas these lenses apply to more general types of photography, whether it's landscapes or portraits. And there's also different characteristics. Like these two lenses, for example, although they have very similar heights, they have completely different optical characteristics. Some lenses are designed to capture at a wide angle, so if you're capturing something in, indoors, for example, and you're photographing a person, you could include the ceiling, the walls, and the person. Whereas with something like this, where it's a telephoto lens, which means it's capturing at a really narrow angle, you're able to capture maybe just a person's face. Let's now talk about types of lenses. On this table, I have a selection of lenses created for particular needs. There are lenses that will mount on your camera and they will just work. Those are standard lenses. And there are teleconverters that are designed to magnify what you're seeing and they are only gonna work when coupled with other lenses. Now with standard lenses, there are different classifications. There are specialty lenses like this Nikon PCE tilt shift lens. Also, there are different angles of coverage. As I said earlier, some lenses cover really, really wide angles, like this Nikon 1424. From there, it goes to standard, and standard is around 50 millimeters. Then it goes to telephoto and super telephoto. Now, we'll explain what those all mean in focal lengths shortly when we show you examples, but this is just an illustration that there are different types of lenses for different needs. Now, we talked about how wide or narrow you can capture an image, but now we want to show you what it actually means. So, Let's jump into this real quick, and right here you can see that we have an image that is captured at 14 millimeters. We talked about how super wide that 14 millimeter looks like, and you can see here in the image, it actually looks really wide. I can see a lot of the sky, I can see the buildings, the trees, the model looks somewhat small. Now, as I go to 24 millimeters, all of a sudden, now things start to appear larger. The model is now larger, but I'm also cutting off the ground, the sky, and as you can see, the top of the building there is also chopped off. Now, from here, I go to 35 millimeters, and you can see now I'm more focused on the model. There is a lot less of the background involved. And at 50 millimeters, which is considered to be the standard range, now I'm actually cutting her legs off a little bit, but I'm also cutting off a lot of the environment around her. At 70 millimeters, it's even tighter, and as you can see, the background now starts to get a little bit more blurry. I'm getting more definition on her because I'm still focused on her, and here we are at, at 105 millimeters, and as you can see, now the background is a lot more out of focus. We can still see some of the columns, but we can't tell where she's at and what's the environment looking like. Now we're con concentrating more on the subject. 
as we get to 200 millimeters, now the story is almost completely gone. All we see is the model. Now we are basically cutting off half of her body and we're showing you the background that looks really blurry. You can't even tell what it is. And lastly, we're at 300 millimeters. At 300 millimeters, we're so close to her that it's just a portrait and everything in the background is blown out of proportion. There is, you can't even tell what it is. So let's now go back and review real quick what, it, what the change looks like. From 14 millimeter right here, you can see it's super wide all the way slowly getting to 300 millimeters. We haven't changed anything. All we're doing is swapping lenses and changing focal lengths. You can see what that drastic change in each photograph looks like. Now that you know what focal length is, let's talk about aperture because just like focal length, aperture is the property of the lens. Now, before I talk about aperture, let me just say that there are different technical definitions to aperture and where I'm not going to worry about entrance pupil and all other technical jargon. I just want to make this as simple as possible for you to understand. So when you think of a lens, think of a lens just like your eyes. There is a front element of the lens and that front element of the lens is designed just like your cornea of your eyes. It gathers the light, okay? So all that light that's being gathered by the front lens is passing through the lens. And there's a small element inside, as you can see right now, it's really wide open. And by wide open, that's exactly what we mean, is that the light is just passing through. There's nothing blocking the light. Now your eyes also have something called an iris, which contracts or expands depending on the conditions. And here we have exactly the same situation. So we have something called a diaphragm. And from here, I'm just going to stop down. Stopping down means basically reducing the size of that hole. And as I did this, you can see that a lot of the light is now being blocked. So when we talk about aperture, you have to keep in mind that we refer to that size that you see. The smaller it is, the smaller the aperture. The larger it is, the larger the aperture. You'll hear us talk about f-stops quite a bit, and I want to explain what that means. Basically, an f-stop is a number that refers to the size of the aperture, and it can be expressed as something like f1.4, f2.8, f5.6, f16, and so on and so forth. There's also something called maximum aperture, and that's the physical limitation of the lens. And each lens has a limitation. So this lens, for example, right here, it's this 135 millimeter Nikon f2.0 lens. Now that f2.0 refers to the size of the aperture. So the maximum that it can be is f2.0. It cannot go wider than that. Some lenses though can go as wide as f0.95. There are great lenses that are f1.2, f1.4, f2.0 just like this one or 2.8 or even f4.0. Now here we have an interesting example. I have two lenses that share the same focal length, which is 85 millimeters. Here I have an 85 millimeter 1.4 lens, which means that its maximum aperture is limited to 1.4. And here I have an 85 millimeter 1.8 lens, meaning again that it's limited to 1.8. Now if I pick these up, you can see that this lens is larger in, the, in terms of the front element compared to this one. And if I open the aperture on both, you can see that this appears larger than this one. Now, there is a difference of 1.4 versus 1.8, which doesn't sound like a lot. However, when you compare the cost difference between these two lenses, this lens costs three times more than this one. You might be wondering why. Well, the difference seems to be rather small, but it, there is more to think about when you're looking at these lenses. Not only is this giving you more light gathering capability, there is also difference in the make. So this lens is a professionally graded lens. As you can see, there's a gold ring here, which for Nikon lenses indicates it's proline, whereas this one doesn't have it. So this lens has more metal inside and more glass inside, more optical corrections built into the lens versus this one. When you compare lenses like that, you also have to keep in mind that although the focal length might be the same, apertures might be somewhat similar, there's different types of lenses in terms of make, their optical formulas, their coating, and many other things combined. I've got a few different lenses in front of me, and just so you know what they are, I'm gonna read them off really quickly. This is a 24 millimeter, this is a 50 millimeter, this is a 24 to 70 millimeter, and this is a 24 to 120 millimeter. Now, what's the difference between all these? You'll notice on these two, I said one number, 
these two I said two numbers. So these are what are referred to as prime lenses. They have a fixed focal length. So a 24 millimeter lens can only photograph at 24 millimeters. If I put this on my camera and I want to take a picture of a subject, it appears a certain way in my camera. If I want my subject to appear closer, I have to actually walk closer to it. If I want it to appear farther away, I have to walk away from it. Now, these are zoom lenses. Now what a zoom lens is, it contains a range of focal lengths within the same lens. So if I put this 24 to 70 on my camera, I can start at 24 millimeters and get a very wide scene. Now, when I zoom into 70 millimeters, the scene suddenly becomes a lot more narrow. So which lens should you choose? This 24 to 70 millimeter, it actually covers the focal lengths of 24 millimeters, 50 millimeters, everything between these two, and everything between 50 and 70 millimeters. So right away you can see this does the same job as these two lenses, plus more. This lens, it actually does even more than this one. This is a 24 to 120. So it includes all three of these focal lengths, plus everything from 70 to 120 millimeters. Why would you choose any of these lenses when you could just buy this one? Well, it's a little bit more complicated than just focal length. When you're comparing lenses, there's more to consider than just focal length. There's also maximum aperture. Now this lens is an f1.4, which means it can gather a lot of light. This is an f1.8, which means it gathers a little bit less light than this one. This is a 2.8, which means it gathers less light than either of these lenses. Now this lens, it covers a huge range of focal lengths, including all three of these lenses, but it's an f4 lens, so it actually gathers the least amount of light of any of these lenses. So what's that all mean? Well, sometimes you'll hear photographers refer to prime lenses as fast, so you've got a fast lens. What that means is it's able to function in low light, which you know f1.4 lens lets in a lot more light than a 2.8 or a f4 lens. It also allows you to shoot at higher shutter speeds, which we're going to discuss a little bit later. Prime lenses also really separate subjects from backgrounds. So you've seen those photos with a nice blurry background and a really crisp subject. That's probably a prime lens. Now, as a wedding photographer, I shoot with prime lenses, but zoom lenses are just as useful. I love primes because at a wedding reception when it's really dark, it lets me gather every bit of light that's there and still get a great shot. It also gives me beautiful portraits where my bride and groom are separated from a nice blurry background. During a ceremony though, sometimes a zoom can come in really handy. Often you're restricted on how far and how much you can move. Being able to stand in one place and cover a range of focal lengths with a zoom is just such a great thing. So what's the difference between these two prime lenses and these two zoom lenses? Well, to start off, these are both professional grade lenses and these are both enthusiast grade lenses. Basically what that means, if you ever pick one up, this is going to be a lot heavier than this. The professional, you can just feel there's a much greater build quality. It's a metal lens, it has much higher quality glass inside, it's sealed, and it's just overall a much sturdier lens. It's the same with the zoom lenses. Now even though they both have gold rings, don't let that fool you, this is an enthusiast lens, this is a professional lens. That means just like this one, it's going to have better build quality and better optics. Now one feature that this lens has that none of these lenses have is image stabilization. Now different brands call it different things. Nikon, for example, calls it vibration reduction. Canon calls it image stabilization. Other brands call it something completely different. What's more, some brands have it built into the lens. Other brands have it built into the camera. So what does image stabilization do? Well, it allows you to shoot in low light conditions while effectively reducing camera shake. When you hold a camera, your body moves just a little bit and it's not really something that you can control. Some people have really stable hands, some people's aren't as stable. Vibration reduction or image stabilization actually helps compensate for that, helping you get sharp images in low light. Here we want to show you how effective image stabilization can be when shooting in low light environments. So John is hand holding camera and he has a really heavy 7200 f2.8 lens and the reason why we're using this lens is because it has image stabilization so we can show you the effect when we turn it on and turn it off. So obviously it's turned off right now and you can see the video is quite jumpy. There is nothing that John can do about it but whether he's using that lens or any other lens it will still be shaky and the video shows this pretty well but if you were to do stills it would have been even worse because in the stills you see a lot more resolution. So let's go ahead and turn image stabilization on now 
and boom, the effect is visible right away. It's a lot less jumpy. Now it's smooth, and although there is a little bit of movement, and that's because the lens is trying to compensate for that movement, it's still very acceptable. So whether you're shooting stills or video, and you're shooting in low light environments, make sure to keep that image stabilization on, because it will help tremendously. This particular lens right here is a 24 to 120 millimeter zoom lens. It's got a maximum fixed aperture of f4. Now, what that means is when I zoom this lens, I can go from 24 millimeters all the way to 120 millimeters, and the aperture stays constant at f4 the entire range of the zoom. Some lenses aren't built that way. They, have, they can have a zoom range for focal lengths. They can also have a range of apertures. Now, this particular lens is just like the kit lens that probably came with your camera. Most people's cameras came with, if you bought a camera, came with a lens, it's probably an 18 to 55 millimeter, and then the, the aperture also has a range that might be something like f3.5 to f5.6. That's called a variable aperture. What that means is when you zoom out to its widest, 18 millimeters, your maximum aperture is limited to f3.5. When you zoom in to its tightest, 55 millimeters, your maximum aperture is limited to 5.6. Also, variable aperture lenses are usually consumer grade lenses. Now what that means is they typically have a lower build quality than other lenses, and they also are gonna limit you by having that variable aperture, which means when you're at the end of your zoom range and you're zoomed in tight on your subject, you're collecting a lot less light than you would be with say a professional zoom lens. To illustrate the difference between a variable aperture zoom lens, a fixed aperture professional zoom lens, and a prime lens, we went out and shot some photos just so you can really see how different they look. Now the first lens that we shot with was a variable aperture zoom lens. We set it to 50 millimeters, which gave us an aperture of f5.6. That's pretty typical for most consumer kit lenses. Now you can see in this image, the model's in focus but so is the background. You can clearly make out buildings, lampposts, trees, and people. This is the best image we can get with this particular lens because we're limited by the aperture. Now this image we switched to a professional zoom lens with a fixed aperture of f2.8. We still set it to 50 millimeters just to have the same look as the previous image. In this one you can see the background is getting a lot softer and blurrier. The model is still nice and sharp. Details in the background are starting to fade out and it's overall a more appealing image. Finally, we switch to a prime lens. Now this is a 50 millimeter, the same focal length as our previous two images, but you can see what a difference this makes. The biggest change here is the background. You can see the buildings are a lot softer. We're st starting to get some really nice highlights back there, and you can hardly tell that there's trees and lampposts behind her. The biggest change here is the aperture. This is shot at f1.4. That really separates our model from the background and gives it this unique look. Let's go through the images one more time. Now we've got f1.4, 2.8, and f5.6. Which do you prefer? Everyone has different tastes. I personally love the f1.4. I shoot with primes and I just love the look. I can really concentrate on my subject and they just pop from that background. In the early days of photography, there was no such thing as autofocus. Lenses and bodies did not have that technology. That meant when you put a lens onto a camera, you had to look through the viewfinder and you had to twist the ring to actually acquire focus on your subject. Today, we have autofocus. What that means is lenses and bodies can actually communicate with each other to lock focus on your subject without you actually having to turn or do anything. You'll also encounter modern lenses that are manual focus. For example, this Zeiss lens is a modern lens it's an amazing piece of glass, but it's manual focus. Does that mean it's a bad lens? No, of course not. Why? Well, it could be licensing restrictions or other limitations that prevent third-party manufacturers of lenses like Zeiss from including autofocus in their lenses. Some of these older manual focus lenses are a tremendous value, and some of the newer ones can produce beautiful images. But there's one thing you need to be aware of about manual focus lenses. They can take a lot of practice in order to produce consistently sharp images. You've probably been using your lens for a while now, but have you been using the hood? We're gonna talk about lens hoods and why you should use them and what exactly they do. These days, most lenses include a hood provided by the manufacturer. If you buy an older lens that's either new or used, chances are it won't come with a hood, 
so you either have to buy one from the manufacturer or from a third party provider. Lens hoods are objects that fit on the front of your lens and they come in different sizes, shapes, and materials. Some are rubber, some are plastic, and some are metal. There are also different types of hoods. Some, like on a wide angle or a fisheye lens, are built in and are non-detachable hoods. They're a permanent fixture on that lens. You'll see lots of different sizes of lens hoods. It really depends on the optical design of the lens, but some can be really small, some can be large, and super telephotos can have enormous hoods. So why do you even need a lens hood? A lens hood's main reason is to keep light from hitting the front of your lens. So you can see it actually extends out from the front element of the lens a little bit. So any light that's coming from the top or from the side is going to be uh, hopefully blocked from hitting the front of the lens. Now what happens when light hits your lens? Usually it creates ghosting and flare, which really can hurt and harm an image. It can be used for creative uses, but typically it's not something you want. We're standing outside and you can see there's a whole lot of light around here shining right into the lens. We have ghosting, we have flare, we have all this kind of stuff going on, lots of contrast. So watch what happens when I block the sun from the lens just like a lens hood does. Looks a whole lot better, right? Lastly, there's built-in and retractable lens hoods. Now these are not removable from the lens, but they do collapse. So all you have to do is twist, goes down. You can also pull, twist, and it's fixed. Now let's talk about lens hood shape. This one, for example, is round. Same with this one here. Now this one is petal shaped, and you can see it kind of looks like a flower petal, hence the name. Now this one, this lens hood is a third party hood, and it's just collapsible. It's still round, but it collapses for really easy transport. That's about it for lens hoods, and as you can tell, they're really important parts of your lens. Now one thing to note, they're not interchangeable between lenses. So if you have one that fits on a different lens, you don't want to use it that way. They're not designed to be interchangeable. Every single lens hood is made for a specific lens, so you want to make sure to use the one that came with your lens. When looking at camera or lens specifications, you might have come across such terms as crop factor, equivalent field of view, or equivalent angle of view. Now, we're not going to discuss these in detail because the topic can be quite advanced, and to be honest, it's not worth the time. So, if you have a camera and you're happy with it, you're not considering moving to a different format, or maybe upgrading to full frame, then just skip over the section. It's really not that important. However, if you have a camera and you're considering moving up in sensor size or maybe to a different system with a different sensor size, then crop factors can be important. And this is the section for you. If you currently have a small sensor camera and you're thinking about moving up to full frame, there are a few important considerations you have to keep in mind. But before we go there, you first need to look at your lenses because you need to make sure that those lenses are going to be compatible. Now on this table, we have a few different cameras and lenses from Nikon and Canon. And I want to show you specific examples of how you can identify lenses that will not work on your future full frame camera. So right here, we have the Nikon 55 to 200 millimeter DX lens. Now that DX designation basically means that the lens is designed for a DX or small sensor camera. Canon has a very similar thing because they also have small sensor and full frame cameras. So this one right here is the 17 to 55 millimeter EFS lens. And that EFS designation also basically means that this lens is only designed to work with small sensor camera. Now, if you're taking these lenses and trying to mount them on full frame cameras, since the mounts are the same, they might mount. In the case of Canon, it won't work. In the case of Nikon, take a look at what happens if we mount this 55 to 200 on this Nikon D800 camera. And as you can see, the borders are very dark and that happens because these lenses are simply not designed to cover the full frame sensor. So the lens by itself is made smaller and cheaper as we've said before, and that image circle is simply not large enough to cover it. So consider these lenses incompatible with full frame. But what if you have lenses that don't specifically say DX or EFS, if it's a Nikon or Canon, or maybe you have a third party lens that you know is compatible with full frame? Then in that case, great news. It means it will work in your future camera. However, there is a surprise there. Once you mount that lens on your full frame camera, the image will actually look different. How? It will simply appear wider. Why? Because that lens is specifically created to cover larger image circle. With a smaller sensor, you're essentially chopping off the corners of the image. 
So although your lens was originally developed to cover a large image circle, so which means that it can actually cover a larger sensor, you were actually using a smaller portion of it. To make it easy to understand how field of view differs when switching from a smaller sensor to a larger sensor camera, or perhaps the other way around, manufacturers came up with something called the crop factor. And crop factor is a very easy way to calculate that. So you basically take the crop factor, which is also known as the multiplication factor, and multiply it with the focal length. So the 50 millimeter lens, for example, that you've been loving so far on your DX camera, all this time has actually not given you what a 50 millimeter lens would have given you on a full frame camera. That 50 millimeter is actually something around a 75 millimeter equivalent. 50 multiplied by 1.5, 75 millimeters. So this 55 to 100 millimeter lens, that 55 to 200 is the physical property of the lens. It's its focal length. It doesn't change when you go from one camera to another. So you have to multiply that 55 to 200 by 1.5x and that's its equivalent field of view. Now some people will say something like, I could take a Nikon 300 millimeter lens and mount it on a 1.5x crop factor DX camera and have a 450 millimeter lens. What they're saying is actually false because the focal length, just like I said, is the physical property of the lens. So that never changes. Aperture, focal length, optical characteristics of the lens, that's with the lens. So in this case, the 300 millimeter lens doesn't magically become a 450 millimeter lens. The only thing that's happening is you're chopping off the corner, so you're essentially making it appear more narrow. There's one case where using small sensors in combination with long lenses can be advantageous, but that only applies to sports and wildlife photographers. We're not going to talk about it here in detail, just simply go to photographylive.com and you can find out more. Let's go ahead and demonstrate what the difference between a full frame camera and a camera with a 1.5x crop factor sensor looks like. So in this case we are shooting our model at full frame and you can see that there is plenty of space around her. Now let's go ahead and switch to DX and see how much crop we will see in the resulting image. Now that we switch to 1.5x crop factor camera you can see that the border of the frame is chopped off. We're now seeing a lot less of the frame. The model appears closer, although we haven't physically changed the distance. So the camera to subject distance remains exactly the same, but now the model appears larger in the image. 